My name is Lenore von Stein, and this is a, yet another episode of The Facts. And today, is The Facts is, a, is music and discussion separately. And this is discussion. And with me tonight is Alan Fagenberg, who teaches architecture and education at the City College, uh, which is part of the City University of New York. And um, we're going to talk tonight about uh, the achievement gap. We had one discussion about it, and it led us into sort of, I thought, quickly and, and smartly into into individuality. Uh, and um, and I, I I started. I'm going to start off with a I start off that, and I'll start off this with a with a, a little section of Montaigne, who I've been. Um, spending uh, mornings with. And um, he lived in the 1500s. He was maybe the first essayist or he called himself that, and, and or somebody called him that. Maybe he didn't do it. And um, in time of wars and pestilence and, and uh, lousy government and, and the plague, he had the whole nine yards. And so he, here's a, a small section of something he wrote on judgment. Judgment holds in me a presidential seat. At least it carefully endeavors to hold it. It suffers my appetites to keep their course, both hatred and love. Yea, and that I bear unto myself without suffering alteration or corruption. If it cannot reform other parts according to itself, I think he's talking about judgment, at least it will not be deformed by them. It keeps its court apart. For some degree of intelligence is required to be able to mark that one is ignorant. And we must knock at a gate to know whether it be shut. Affirmation and self-conceit are manifest signs of foolishness. So, uh, it's so complex, I'm not even sure why I like it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I'm sure about you know, parts of it. So, so this thing about achieving and, and, and the achievement gap, this is something that's spoken about in many circles of society. The, 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 all these people that are you know, on the other side, one side or the other of this yeah. gap. Um, and w what is this achievement gap about? What is say something about this say achievement? About yeah. Well, continue what we're saying. I think it, it's uh, of course fascinating because what the connotation is: if you have achievement, that also means then you have to have non-achievement. So you have to set up criteria. Really, that's what you're talking about is a judgment, and the judgment becomes about people, about students, about kids, about their potential, about their worth. Uh, and I think one of the things um, what, at the end what you were talking about is really the, the, the dialectics, the unity of opposites, that one has to exist without the other. And it's interesting that in, um, in education, one of the things a number of years ago, a little bit aside, but a number of years ago, our administration put forward a committee to study grades. And the claim was there was an inflation of grades. Why? Well, the logic goes that there's a bell curve. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the logic goes that in any class, in any school, in any institution, that C is the average. That half the people are above C and half the people are below C. Mm -hmm. And as you go up, it diminishes. So the small minority are A's and then larger B's and the most C's and then a little less is D's and then some people should fail. And the administration was getting aggravated because there were uh, areas of the curriculum or classes where it wasn't following the bell curve, where maybe things were, quote, too high in terms of averages. Mm -hmm. And the comments were, was, well, but it's all different. You know, you don't judge based on some kind of preset standard. You set up certain qualitative, quantitative things, and you would do an assessment within that. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it's possible. I mean, I have classes, and there's some classes where I just have a group of really incredible, hardworking, inquisitive students where they're all A's and B's, and other classes where they're not. And to follow the standard is kind of, uh, to me, ridiculous. Um, on that, uh, I think the thing that you're talking about also 
in terms of this is that we're, we're stuck in a thing of testing. Testing has become a big industry, right? And we have to prepare our kids for tests, and now they're actually preparing kids for testing in kindergarten and before. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you want your kids to get good test scores. But it's kind of set up like any competitive sport, is everybody can't do well. So you have to have within all testing some people who do well, and some people do okay, and some people who fail. Because otherwise there's no competitive nature to it. And I think the, the other thing about testing, and there are parents who bring uh, suits, or now SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, have to provide and allow for students who are so-called qualified to have longer. They don't have to finish within the same time. If they have learning challenges, mm -hmm. all right? So one of the things that happens is not only do you have to have correct answers, but you have to have correct answers with a certain limited amount of time. So it seems the criteria for making these, these assessments and seeing who's achieving is already determined and perverted by some outside definition of what that means. I see. It's like a hockey game. You have so many minutes, and whoever has the most points at the end wins. You have so, the SAT scores, and you have a certain number of minutes, and whoever has the highest scores at the end wins. So how do you judge who is, oh, it's a way of, coming up with a way of judging who is going to move forward and who's not going to move forward Absolutely. and what are the traits that we are looking for in the in the movers and shakers and who, what are the people who are left behind who are uh, what does this guy Montaigne says? He says, judgment holds, he said, well, aside from the presidential seat, he says it holds, a, it holds a presidential seat, at least it carefully endeavors to hold it. And how does it carefully endeavor to hold it? it, it if I understand correctly what he's writing here, it suffers my appetites to keep their course. Now, it doesn't mess with me too much, because if it messes with me too much, it's, it, it, I, it, may got, you know, it may not win. And it, it, like both hatred and love, leaves those alone. You hate who you like, you love who you like. This is a separate thing. Yea, and, and, and that I bear unto myself without, I, I don't alter it or it does, I don't corrupt it. Um, if I cannot reform other parts according to itself, well, now I'm lost. At least <laughs> it will not be deformed by them. It keeps them apart. Um, I, as, I, as I've grown up uh, slowly, <laughs> uh, uh, I've, I've become less judgmental. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine myself when I was younger not hying to these judgments. They were so important in keeping my world you know, the way I needed it to be, you know, for whatever set of reasons I needed it to be there. Uh, and and they they got in my way because they were they narrowed my scope and uh, so uh, so I'm less I'm less judgment I mean even if other people don't notice it uh, I'm less a lot less judgmental than I was it was it was a it was a way it was a it was a one of the defense mechanisms that have slowly given way. As I as I've gotten older and, and, and whatever you know, more uh, in control of the situation. But that's really healthy. That's terrific. I mean, to come back, you're talking about you know, like judgment, the day of judgment. And one of the things in my field in architecture is that the focus of the curriculum of the studies is the studio design, the creative aspect, right? How that's graded or assessed, who knows? Anyway, at the end of each project, traditionally, what are set up are called juries. And the students are supposed to put up their work, either drawn or in computer in their models, and they are judged. They're judged by faculty and by architects. And I think that that kind of basis has to also be redefined. So when I'm asked about it, I refuse to do that. I say, no, we're having a review. We're going to look at your work and hopefully have a discussion that it will provoke that we'll learn from and that you'll learn from. But those kinds of pejorative things of judging you, we're going to stand in judgment because we're older or more superior or have more credentials or whatever, I think is inherent in all these things we're talking about. And that's where, you know, this kind of accountability, we're going to be judged. You're going to be judged at every grade on how well you're doing based on our standards, right? And who's making these standards and who has input into this? And more and more, those so-called standards are not even being set by educators. 
they're being set by the business community and by politicians. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a great uh, watcher. I'm going to go home tonight and watch it of right. things like Top Chef and uh, <laughs> uh, um, Project Runway, although Top Chef is a little, well, they're, they're both terrible. You know, and I, I cringe. So why do you watch them? I, I can't stop myself. I don't, I, 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 I watch them. I guess it, part of why I watch this is, is that I, I buy into this thing that the you know the cream will will come Rise to, to the, the top, top you know and but in, like in Project Runway you can really see the eighty six the the most creative designers very early the ones who are doing like bags and crazy stuff like that you know they're the most interesting what is that and um, they they're never going to make it to the end and, um, and but you can't taste the food. Right. So you don't know what these people are doing, and, and well, but um, you can see it. You have a certain you aesthetic can see, of you the can see, visual. You can see the aesthetic, and 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 you can see the 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 the, the, the losers' consternation, you know. And and uh, but in the end, the losers are uh, they may be angry, but but almost always they they the anger is mixed with um, I didn't do a good enough job. You know what? There's a good there's a good example. A number of years ago, we had we uh, did a course with our architecture students and doctoral students at the Graduate Center in environmental psych, and we were studying the relationship of food basically to class and ethnicity. You know, so I mean, it's a typical thing that we all kind of know. If you go into Chinatown, it's one of those walk-in Chinese restaurants on Mott Street or something, and all the ducks are hanging in the window. And when you walk in, you walk past the kitchen, you sit down, and you've already seen what you're going to eat. If you go into a very high-class, fancy um, European restaurant, you never see the kitchen. That's off balance, right? And everything is very chic and very orderly. Um, anyway, we went um, uh, into this very fancy uh, restaurant, and there was somebody there from one of the um, uh, food guides. This was a number of years ago, the write-up recommendations. And they were talking to us about how they had to revise it. Why? Because for many years, their recommendations, they were, being, they were being criticized and challenged that nowhere in their book could people find Thai restaurants, uh, Cuban, Puerto Rican restaurants. The famous restaurants with the best ratings were traditionally always the French ones. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some Italian and maybe a mix or something else, but never others. And people were complaining that there was a bias to their judging of what quality food was. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. were responding to it by saying, well, they were going to have to now differentiate and pull those in, but it was going to depend on the city of how they were going to do it. I think it was uh, Zagats or something, right? Um, so I think that's it, the, you know, the whole idea of, of being judged and what, what basis is it when people, we have this funny thing in our family around wine. I have some family members who like good wine, and they think that we're hilarious because we don't know the difference. I said, well... I know what I like, you know. What difference does it make? Isn't it a matter of taste? No. There's a there's a reality. There's a so, uh, uh, objectivity to this that some people impose on this. And I think the same thing happens in schools. Then, in terms of this, is that kids are always feeling judged. Right? They're judged by how they behave. They judge how well they do. They're not judged on their creativity, though. They're judged on how well they do, following orders, following rules, following standards, following correct answers. You know, you know the the Summerhill model. The the uh, oh, yeah. it's quite lovely. The 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 idea of that that kids could be free and they could guide the what's happening, and you could yeah. you could all be working together, and 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 it would be a, they'd be glad to go to school in the morning and not just making that up. You know, just because you'd be. Well, I, I don't remember. I read the book was a long so time ago. Go back yeah. and read it, yeah. Um, heaven. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, I have a quote on my syllabi. Learning can and should be fun. And I really believe that. Learning is just one of the most exciting, interesting, fun things that could ever happen. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, my wife is an educator. And a number of years ago, she helped set up a, uh, a public school in the Bronx called the Bronx New School. And it was really much more of relating to the kids. The uh, population of the students was chosen by lottery, reflective of the population in that area of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So it was really diverse, economically, racially, every way. And I remember one of the, one of the so, so many wonderful things that happened there. 
But there were times where Beverly would tell me that she would be getting calls or parents who would tell her they were having difficulty or problems with their kids. Why? Because it was Saturday and Sunday, and the kids were waking up wanting to go to school, and their parents were telling them, well, it's the weekend, there is no school, and the kids were upset that there was no school. They were having such a good time because they were really involved in their own learning that this was just the most wonderful place to be, and not being there to them was detrimental. As opposed to going to other schools, and we see there are guards at the doors, and there are metal bars on the windows, and kids get frisked and have to go through scanning that's almost as bad as the airports, and they have to sit in rows, and they can't talk, and they have no recess, and they're not allowed out. And my goodness, what a kid's must feel about learning under that kind of physical environment. Remember when I was a kid, I, I, there was no subject I didn't like. Really? I liked them all, but what I didn't like were the teachers. <laughs> and um, it was, and what I, I didn't like their attitude towards the kids. And, and they were, I used to think, I used to say, they were so rude towards the children and they, How did that and, play and, out? And, and they, well, they, they would say things to the kids that they wouldn't say to adults. Right. They would, they would, and, and it was just untenable, you know, and I couldn't find, um, I couldn't find an avenue, a way to be part of this and, and, yeah. and, and, and not do something wrong, you know, not, you know, to my fellow students, to myself, uh, and, and, and it, and it killed the, you know, the interest. And plus they were, you know, they were, they were way behind where I was and maybe where some of the other people were in terms of what they were presenting. Uh, and so these were, the, and, and then by, you know, junior high or high school, you, you're, you're more or less drained, you know, you, you know, the, there's nothing there. It's just, you, you, well, you know, there were interesting things, but it, it was, it was, they took that joy. It, it, they they sapped that yeah. joy, you know, uh, uh, yeah. and, and if they did that, um, I mean, I, I can't imagine when we were doing some of these other shows and talked about no recess, that just blows me away. Isn't it terrible? And, and, and I remember at one point I was, I was, when I was substitute teaching in, in public schools, I was, uh, I, uh, there was this kindergarten teacher who uh, decided I might be a good regular substitute for him, and he, he showed me what he was doing with these these kids, and he had, you know, these little tables, you know, and it was like, it was like they were in boot camp, you know, and, and they would get up, you know, now we do blocks and we do this, and, yeah. and then we get, and you move to table four, and you move to table three, and he said, that's where you got to handle them. You got to have them, you got to have them under control all the time. It's good preparation for life. And, um, and, um, you know, and it did, you know, there were these little kids running around these little silly areas, and, and um, it was... I took over that class and I brought in this 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 um, this cassette that I'd gotten, Lebanese cassette. It said um, something about sleeping. It was a beautiful title, and um, and I put it on for them. And there's the little kids dancing <laughs> around, you know, doing their imitation, you know, dances. And uh, sure. you know, that's that's who they were. You know, that that was a whole lot more fun than let, you know, let kids be kids. Yeah, let let and and let them develop their brains, you know, and their, their, their sensibilities. And so back to this, what are we going to do about this? Uh, uh, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about this achievement? What do, what do you do? What do you do as a, as a teacher at City College to, to um, with your students? I mean, I, I teach too, and I have a lot of students who can't read very well. Who can't write very well? How and I hand them these college textbooks, and how are they going to? I mean, they can't, you know. And so I try to find different ways to mm -hmm. mark what they're doing. I don't mark their spelling, you know. And um, in the, you know, in the 15 weeks, I get to hang with them to help them, help them, you know, bring their ideas to the fore. What do you do? Well. I try different things, and some are more successful and some are less successful because I think, well, I think first of all in the broad range is that there's only a limited amount that we can do as adult, as educators, because we only have a little bit of contact and influence within a much larger context. And there's a whole other world in society, culture, 
that's telling kids something very different than what we're trying to do. All right? So I think it's important, and I think they're, I don't know, I teach college, so it's a little, a little bit different, but not entirely, because I'm getting, up to now, certainly most of my students are coming from New York City public schools. And I have a class, which is a seminar, and I have them write every week, even though it's architecture. They write every week. And I know as a pattern, I'll give them an assignment the first week. I'll say, okay, next week you have to do a paper, and it's usually about your background, your culture, how you came here. Just something very open-ended. And the vast majority of the time, the papers will come back, and I'll look them over, and the next week I'll give them back, and I'm saying, they're unacceptable. They're unacceptable. I will not read these. Why not? Well, it looks like you sat down and just ripped out a piece of paper and wrote it. You didn't spend any time. You didn't look it over. You didn't correct it. You didn't da, 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 da. And they, they get pretty upset. I find by about the third paper, it's almost like a different group of people. And I think part of it is respecting that they can do it and demanding it. And to, not demanding it as an authoritarian way but to explain that this type of communication is essential, that they need to be able to do this. Not everybody's going to become an author or writer. I'm not. Mm -hmm. But I think, like anything else, like speaking, like writing, for them drawing, making models, is something they have to have a certain competency in to survive and to live and to get along. And I think that's part of the education, to see the importance of it. And a lot of them have always been told they're stupid, and they've be then they can't write, and they've begun to absorb that and don't even try anymore. Yes, okay. yes. I also think, not for everybody, for a lot of people, to find areas for them to write or to do things about that come from their own interests in their own lives. Not to write about some esoteric thing that some literature teacher is studying from the 18th century or whatever. All right? I think it's important at some level, but I think they have to be able to talk and write about their own experience to communicate it, and that out of that comes a need to communicate it. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and also if they could find something in that 18th century literature that that was rel you know, then, relevant, you know, relevant to them, and they could, if depending on the teacher, well, yeah. you know. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I agree with this, and I think it's really difficult. I think also that things like reading and writing are seem to be losing a little bit of the impact, thrust, importance that certainly we had as kids, and there's much more visual reading in terms of text messaging, and that kind of stuff where people are doing creative spelling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of debate about that. Is that okay? And in some ways, I think it is because writing and reading is a form of communication. So why do we accept it on our little Palm Pilot or iPhone, but not accept it if it's written on paper? I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, no, I, you know, these little shortcuts, do you, you know, yeah. you know, the, I mean. I mean, I do that as a joke when I'm writing to people, you know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm still doing emails, mm -hmm. and for you be a four and a you. Mm -hmm. You know, some people think it's clever, and other people think it's uh, outrageous. Yes, yes, <laughs> it's a little bit of both, right? It's a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah, uh, we, we're getting close to the end of this conversation. Um, oh, wow. That happened. Um, you guys, there, was, there was one other thing I wanted to add to this because you were asking about the yeah. achievement gap. And one of the other things I find very upsetting is, um, and it's, hap it's happened throughout, of some teachers or some schools that will reward students for things, for learning, for writing. I don't think, I think every kid deserves to be rewarded, not just picking out a few. The other thing is what's happening now is there's some school districts and states who have come up with ideas that they're going to provide money rewards to teachers whose kids do better. Oh. And I think that's oh. just horrible. I mean, the kids then are becoming more and more of a commodity, and the only way I think we're being pushed to see them as a way for us to do better, not really interested in their own growth and development. Yeah, I mean, what, what a message about, about why yeah, you're doing yeah. what you're doing and For who money. you are to them and who they are to you. You know, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's really terrifying. And I, I, terrifying. I, 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 Can I use an example as, yeah, a, as an example? Yeah. My younger daughter went to Central Park East up at, uh, in Harlem, East Harlem. And one of the things they did, which was so moving, when, the, when, when she was in sixth grade and they had a sixth grade graduation for all the kids, and the kids had done an art project. They all designed and made their own chair that they put on stage that they sat on. So it was all individualized, and it was incredible. The other thing they did is that every single kid in that graduating class got an award for something. 
And it wasn't forced, it wasn't fake. The, the, the philosophy, the pedagogy there of the teachers and the administrators and parents said every kid was special in some way. Yes, and they are, and, and they, they are. are. And they made this a public thing by doing, and it was just beautiful to be there and see that happening. And to see the kids all standing proud because they had, every one of them had something to be proud of. Yes, yes. Uh, we've got two minutes. <laughs> Uh, and um, that lessens the achievement gap. <laughs> yeah, no, but that thing about, I mean, it, you know, and, and, and you'd really have to, you'd, you'd have to, you know, I don't know how much time it would take, but you'd have to take some time thinking about these kids, getting to know these kids, getting yes. to know your students, and, and what, what, what is it, uh, um, outstanding. I had a student in a, in a government class, and he said to me, he was this big gangly guy, he's a really nice guy, and he, he said, um, democracy, don't we have to have everybody's, everybody's voice in there if we're going to figure out how to handle things? I mean, and I'm, 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 I'm messing with it. It was so profound and um, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it's about here, you know, this, that notion of, of um, the, the, the importance of people, the individual, the importance of them, individual, not just individuals learning how to exploit other individuals, um, but individuals, you know, expressing, them expressing and, you know, and learning from other yeah. individuals. And it's, you know, it's, it's not a jungle out there, is it? I don't, you know, it's not a, it's not, we're not just lions, you know, trying to keep other lions from eating our food, you know, it's, this. Well, except there's some people that push that, you know, that there's the, 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 the claim in, in some behalf is that there's a limited amount, there's limited resource, and if somebody else gets it, you don't. So you've got to fight for it. You know, and I think that, that kind of competitive element, again, is what, you know, keeps, keeps us all go keeps a lot of us going because we buy into it. So we're, gonna, we're, we're at the end. Alan Fagenberg. Nice talking to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, uh, the time and, goes and so, fast. And, and so this is the goodbye for the facts, and you know, and not uh, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs>